This is Carolyn Garcia, also known as Mountain Girl, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner, and our engineer is Anita Brockington. We're listening to a live performance of Peter Rowan's Land of the Navajo, which we'll talk about later this hour. But just listen to the control of his voice that he has here. Listen to this. I just love that Native American vocalizing that he does. This Land of the Navajo was recorded live with Peter Rowan's Texas Trio with special guests Bazar Clements and Del McCourtney at the Old Settlers Music Festival in Driftwood, Texas in 2003. Last hour, we heard American Eagle Tragedy and as I've noted time and time again, this song just makes me cry because it reminds me especially of this past, what's been going on in our country with a president that I could not tolerate. We almost, in this election, could have lost our country. And that meant a great deal to me because of my previous experiences on this planet. Are you with us there, Peter? I'm there. I'm right with you. So that's the major reason why it popped up so strongly recently is because I kept thinking about of almost losing this country. And with all the lying that was going on, it, it could have happened. So it was quite a shock to go through that. It was like a horror, actually. But, I agree with you, yeah. All right. Would you please tell us more about Earth Opera and the other band members? What were you hoping to accomplish with this group? Well, t uh, quite honestly, Bob, you know, when I met you and during that time, that was the Washington, D.C. area had been such a cradle of my own inspiration from bluegrass and guitar players like Roy Buchanan and other folks in the area. Tremendous folks, John Caparakis and uh, Carl Chatsky, more people than I can mention that were, I mean, Tom Gray of the Country Gentleman, uh, Alice Gerard. D.C. was the hotbed of creativity for me. Even when I was with the Bluegrass Boys, we would come through town and go out and play with local people in town. It was a hotbed. Mike Seeger was alive at the time, and he was I, – I, I missed that man so much. He, he was such a light uh, for the roots of bluegrass, the roots of blues, old-time music. You know, he played the mouth bow and all this stuff. And to be coming out with a band like Earth Opera – I wasn't sure people were going to accept it, but I was driven by something beyond my own capabilities to understand. I was quite confused. And, of course, we, you know, we loved the confusion. You know, we, we, we smoked a lot of uh, herb at, in those times, and, and, and it was kind of like we passed through that and went on to other things so quickly, you know, that it was hard to register uh, what had happened. I mean, as after I left the Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys and signed with Electra Records and, and we're touring with the Doors and the music is changing and it's adapting to my poetry. It's opening up. It, the tempos are changing from the uplifting, bouncing beats of Bluegrass to the dirge-like qualities of the anti-war songs. And uh, I really... Uh, if I had anything to say about listening to me now, I was so overwrought. You know what I mean? The thing about Jim Morrison was they had seasoned themselves for several years in front of an audience in L.A. They were at the house band at the Whiskey. And uh, we never had a chance to settle down. We had no club gigs. There was no place to play except uh, up in the rock and roll clubs. Now, they were cool. But again, it was so keyed up. You know, you're so, like, wanted to penetrate that audience, you know, that being cool 
I kind of missed that. <laughs> I missed out on being cool. <laughs> but but I, you were super you know, cool. I, I, mean... <laughs> I, you know, I guess, but I, I was very uh, wrought, you know what I mean, wrought with emotions uh, in the throes of creativity rather than the result of creativity. I was in the, the turmoil of creativity writing that material and, and performing it. It was, it was a very it, – it drove me to Buddhism. <laughs> oh, well, you went to the right because, place. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know where to put that energy, you know, right. and, and, it, and it, it was very upsetting. You know, I, I stayed in a state of uh, emotional uh, unrest for a sustained period of time that was, I don't know, either has extended my life or shortened my life. I don't know yet, but I think it. it I, what I did was put my heart into it. And as you know, as an artist, you, you've got to have equal amount of intellect to organize the heartfeltness of what you're doing. Otherwise, I mean, and for me anyway, now I don't know, for other geniuses in this world, <laughs> maybe they don't have to edit their own work or think twice. And I certainly wasn't at the time. I, was, I had no editor in my brain, and I was only doing what was spontaneous at the moment. And that's good but it's like free jazz when you finish playing free jazz it's only what you did during those 30 minutes of free music that is what that is mm -hmm. you don't carry it forward because it was beyond the bounds of a concept so that that took me to on a spiritual path after a while where to understand what my mind was going through was to sit down in a forest under a tree and return to something very basic that I had known as a kid. But, uh, you know, it was extremely <laughs> inspiring. I forget what the question was, <laughs> but well, Earth Opera was just this unraveling of ideas. And I have to say, they got behind me to a point. And then they were looking at me like Captain Ahab, the band members. They, they, they figured I was like, you know, so uncategorizable. You know, that was the one of the things we wanted to be, but the record business wanted to just, us to be a package. Yes, and, that's right. Uh, and we're in the throes of, like, throwing away all the boundaries of bluegrass and everything it, to pursue this crazy music. And I have to say, hearing that part of the American Eagle tragedy, we were into it. My goodness. <laughs> Well, then you can can you imagine what an audience of that was a full capacity audience you were in front of, and and of course they were all excited about the, the uh, doors and uh, waiting for them to come on. And when this popped up, it was like, holy cow! Let's have more of that. We got to have more of that. Uh, and I heard it from yes. for days afterwards. Bob, why didn't you yes. tell you know I could because I had no power for nothing. You know. <laughs> Well, but here's the thing, Bob. We were like the MC5. That part of that music that we were playing was anarchistic. It didn't have a place to go which was like, hey, people get together, everybody love one another. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't, it, we were playing music that exploded the resistance of how do you package that? How do you market that direct blow to the heart which questions authority I mean, the Doors did it in a way that, that they were so seasoned, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was so sad to hear about Jim's decline into alcoholism and stuff, but he, you know what I mean, he was so disaffected from the American world and even the experience of being in the Doors. I mean, he knew me because I was in the audience at several shows on the front row because of Electra Records to say, we want you to come to the Doors show. We got to meet the Doors and this and that. And when we made the record and toured with them, the turmoil of the times. I mean, remember, this is heading towards, you know, 1968, the world, kids marching on the streets all over the place, tear gas, running around, you know, the, the Democratic Convention in, you know, Chicago and the, and the tragedies of the assassinations of, you know, Kennedy, first of all. Yeah. You know, that opened the door to the emotional madness that I was feeling. Kennedy and then King, Martin Luther you King. know, Martin Luther King, yeah. 
another one. And then Bobby Kennedy. Yes. You know, and he's yeah. like, you know, and John Lynn. You know, I mean, the whole thing was madness, I have to say. And to in, in, to interpret the madness through music requires tremendous amount of skill. You have to become like a, somebody like David Byrne. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He has a, a, a seemingly wide open, you know, he, I, I associate him with having the same values that we're talking about, but he's very cool, you know. I mean, very organized, you know. And I, in 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 that period after Bill Monroe and Earth Opera, it became more and more just chaos. Uh, we didn't march on the streets, but musically trying to create a music that expressed what was going on was almost dangerous territory. Well, it was dangerous uh, to, territory. You know, it's personally dangerous because unless you have that artistic maturity to be cool, I mean, to, to you know, make that part of your act, then you're, at the, you're just at the, on the edge of the flames. You're, you are the, the heat at the edge of the flames, you know, and the flames are burning you and you're, you're just putting it out there. And that's just me talking about how I felt at the time. <laughs> Yes, we got one more Earth Hopper question. Can we talk about the album cover for Great American Eagle Tragedy? And I'm just thinking right now, you may not necessarily remember what it all looked like, but I do, I do remember. But go ahead. Yes. But first of all, the cover looks like the United States presidential seal. And before I go any further, I want to tell you that the United States Great Seal is the subject of my PhD, which took around five and a half years. So. There are several presidents that use my work in their work in the White House. So that's another reason why I have such strong connection with this particular album. So who came up with this cover design? Um, David Grisman and our one of our road manager managers at the time, Bob Zachary, also played some guitar with Earth Opera, spent a night, an all-nighter, making a collage out of photographs that had been taken by both uh, Myron Collins, a, a photographer, a friend of ours from Nashville, and some Electra Records publicity shots, and made a collage out of them, because nobody could figure... We felt that Electra, Electra Records' interpretation of Earth Opera was difficult to understand in terms of where we felt our music was. Now that I look back on it, it was great. The, the, the giant birthday cake album cover, you know, where we're like coming out of this sort of Buddha head as a projection from the third eye. I mean, it was just, yes. it was just wild. And the art director at the lecture, God bless him, he he was, uh, <laughs> he had created this thing. And uh, it was an artwork, you know, and everybody at the time was into kind of trying to do their art. So David took photos of the band that we had, had been submitting them as publicity shots, unofficial. Uh, there, some were used by Electra, but anyway, took made a big collage out of those photographs and came up with this. Because it was going to be called The Great American Eagle Tragedy, we couldn't figure out what, what that cover was going to be like. So he, Dave Grisman really put together all this collage of photos and came up with using the you know American Eagle symbol which was the presidential seal or the yes. great seal of some sort, superimposed with a kind of, you'd have to say, a, a death's head, a skull. Yeah, the skull type. Superimposed on it. And again, talk about anti-commercial. But, you know, of the time, I think it's a good piece of artwork. You oh, know, it it's the first, that was the second album. The first album was interpreted by a wonderful artist in L.A., and it was very much... Very much elegant and uh, hopefulness, and there was a bouquet of flowers and a baby being born, and that was the side of Earth Opera that was the the the, the joy hidden in the pain and sorrow of the times. Mm-hmm. The second record was the Great American Eagle Tragedy, and that was, as I said, it was beyond being cool. It was so in your face you know and i think about the mc5 and coming out of the midwest doing the same kind of thing and uh, quite honestly i was influenced by 
so much of our of our time in those moments of those years. There was another band a friend of mine played in called the The Far Cry. And you know, I went for the Far Cry kind of over the top vocal approach where if I had just pulled it back a little bit, we might have been more accessible to the wider audience that of course the record company would have wanted us to be reaching oh we are going to take a break now but i just wanted to say something about the first album though uh, that the home of the brave was so powerful we played that at the very beginning of the show home of the brave when you put that together with the this cover here on the on the great american eagle tragedy you had some real things going on at Okay, so we're going to take another break right now. We're talking to bluegrass legend Peter Rowan about his early days in music and even finishing up here on the American Eagle tragedy, which in my life is a major part. When we do come back, we'll talk about creativity. And this is one of the things I really enjoy about listening to the work of a genius by the name of Peter Rowan. We'll be right back. Hank Williams III, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Hieronymus. Stay tuned. The judge don't know when Red's in town, he keeps well hidden underground. Everybody's acting lazy, falling out, and I hang around. My woman said, hey, Pedro, you acting crazy like a clown. Nobody feel like working, Panama Red is back. Good old 420. Indeed. Panama Red. What would you like to tell us about Panama Red? <laughs> you know, uh, it was, you know, a bunch of my friends went off to Woodstock to the rock festival. Yeah. And I and I at the t- I I passed on it. So did I. And <laughs> and and what I did instead was uh, I was between bands at the time, and what I did instead was I just went down and sang on the streets. And I ran into this other street singer, David Lanham, and we just hung out in Cambridge. I used to buy my herb from the jazz musicians in the in Boston. They all lived up uh, in Roxbury, where less expensive housing, over in the predominantly black neighborhoods of, of that part of town. But, you know, Boston was cool at the time. The only people that had herb were the jazz musicians. So I hung out with the jazz musicians, and I heard some amazing music okay. and played with them eventually, yeah, doing free-form kind of vocalizing. And, uh, you know, uh, some of my favorite moments really were playing with saxophone players who would just allow me to be the tonal center, and they would just hover around and play freely over my, um, you know, improvisation. You know, I'd play a chord and sing a note or two, and they would just kind of flutter like beautiful butterflies around that tone, and then I'd change it, and they'd go with it. Uh, that was liberating, you know? It was mm-hmm. liberating, and a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, herb would be part of the uh, nourishment of the moment. And so I went up to, uh, because I didn't go to Woodstock, I went over to my buddy, the bass player, the jazz bass player, and I said, you got any that herb? And he goes, I mean, the last thing I'd gotten from him was purple pango. It was called purple pango, and it was a purple herb that was a, you know, it's, it, for musicians, very inspiring because you could lose control of your uh, conceptuality and just allow your technique, which was sort of hindered by the herb, but however, everything sounded so unique that, that you could kind of get into some creativity. Uh and uh, he said, no, no more purple tango, but I've got this stuff called Panama Red. And I've learned since then that, you know, the red quality, uh, in the recent research of the people that are creating CBDs and the medicines based on the herb, they, they have stuff that's for, your, for sleep, for calming the body, and it's from the, it's from the sources that are, are the red herbs. And so Panama Red was a very different 
sort of experience. It wasn't like a, a kind of mental blitz. It was more of a body high. It was more like your body relaxed. Whoa. Boy. And your mind kind of and your mind kind of floated. Mm-hmm. It was a body thing. Uh, there are other herbs that people associate that with, like the the Thai stick thing, but Panama Red was very rare. I only seen it one time and I think a few years later maybe somebody gave me some seeds, but nothing I never never saw Panama Red again, but it was red. It was red. Hmm. And it, it was uh, something that relaxed your body, and it was a happy experience. And so Panama Red as a song came out of that, singing on the streets and then going in the back alleys. And <laughs> I was so happy that you were singing on the streets because that's what I would do all the time with a group of other people. It was so much fun. Nobody was embarrassed, and no one yelled at us. They, everyone just went along with it in those days. Do you know that there are groups of singing groups that uh, that get together and to sing for each other, like in in parks and stuff like that? But who I think should be out on singing on the streets. I mean, there are singing groups, and they do some of my songs. Oh, uh, I've a song called "From My Mountain to Your Mountain." Uh, that I recorded with the great Tibetan singer, Yung Chen Lamo. Uh, people have, have, have heard these songs and adopted them as kind of folk songs. It's really great, you know? Yeah. And and they they sing out in public. It's like, uh, what do you call it? Um, spontaneous. What do they call it? They, there was sometimes a spontaneous group dance in a public space. But there's these spontaneous song gatherings now that are great. And I also expand now that the pandemic is lessening, oh, yes. although I'm I'm holding my breath because you you know what's the next surge going to be like? You know that's the that's, terrible part. That's part of it. All right. Now, hey, by yeah. the way, your Wikipedia says you were born on the Fourth of July. Is that true? That is, and I felt it that <laughs> you know the American Eagle tragedy was my personal birthday anthem. Wow. Okay, now we <laughs> now we got to the truth of it. That's. Uh, it, it's, it was in your DNA. I think so. <laughs> indeed, yes, indeed. And all oh, that kind of love on the higher consciousness is really where we need to move and continue to do that. I understand that Earth Opera disbanded in '69, and uh, we would like to talk a little bit about your subsequent career after that. But. I need to step aside from the career biography for a few minutes now and talk about the nature of creativity. Being a visual artist, and I always like to encourage everyone to find their own creativity. I believe everyone is an artist to some degree. Uh, Where do you find inspiration for your writing of your songs? Well, to be very straightforward about it, I find that Intensifying spiritual practice is, I would say, the source of the immediate moment of creating music. For instance, if I can apply the discipline of uh, spiritual practice on a regular level, let's say a couple of hours in the morning of meditation and prayer, and practice in the Buddhist tradition of, of you know, resting in the nature of mind, that the Ideas for music will come if I pick up the medium for that uh, thing, which would be a guitar. The And uh, quite often, there'll be a phrase in my mind that is just down and floating on the ocean of the vastness of the mind and, and allowing that ocean to be become more present in my awareness. I'll often pick up on some of the stuff floating to the surface, <laughs> so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do the songs or melodies come to you in any of your dreams yes 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 i often write down things from dreams sometimes it's a, a i think what they call it a paradigm or a conundrum you know <laughs> like something like you, you you might write it down this moment in sleep and you write it down and you look at it in the morning and it says something like love is love <laughs> you know, but uh, no, uh, quite often there's there are really deep 
things that come out of sleep, deep things that come out of that uh, that kind of uh, vastness of the unconscious uh, workings of the mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. I write things down. Yeah, sometimes you, you keep a little. You know, keep a little pad next to your bed, and uh, when... I, I keep. I've got more papers than I know what to do with. I, no, I, will yeah, I got on... more than you do. <laughs> no, no, I got. <laughs> I got more than you do. I mean, I'll write down on anything. I've got envelopes that I can hardly decipher. They were written in, in darkness, you know. They're like, yeah. I know there's a good idea here, but it looks like some kind of ancient script that I can't decipher. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I write everything down, Bob. Everything, <laughs> and 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 I will pick up a paintbrush for the sheer joy of it. Uh, and and that that. I, I guess when I feel the most at home in creativity mode is I've got the painting there, I've got the notebook there, and i got the instrument right there, and I just kind of work around it, you know? Mm-hmm. And that That's my ideal studio space. Well, I wish I would have learned to play a guitar. I wish I would have learned to play harmonica, et cetera, and I think about that well, a lot. I made a few attempts of it, but I didn't have the patience. That I didn't real. I thought it was just going to flow out of me, you know, putting a harmonica in your mouth and and putting out the sound. Right. But it. <laughs> no, you got to you got to work at it. But hey, let me suggest something. Yes, sir. Um, you you know what a xylophone is, right? Yes, sir. Well, you know, a, a more furniture sized version of that is the marimba. Marimba. And they're not. Marimba and the orchestral marimba is very high end, but the Mexican marimba and the African marimba are you can probably find those for sale used on the web. I think they'd be affordable and quite wonderful because you play them with mallets. Oh, and it's like a keyboard made of wood, and you just kind of tap it with with these soft mallets and you know run run the mallet up and down over it and it, it's it's an ancient instrument it's an ancient instrument it's both percussive and melodic the, the guatemalan marimba is one one version and the african marimba or they call a what do they call it balimba i think i don't know but i have one of the african ones i bought from a musician that was traveling through and it, it's a wonderful thing to have just set up in your studio space, a marimba. I believe uh, Sir George Martin, which I know you know him, right? Yeah. Uh, well, mm-hmm. he, he's in, been several books of mine, and he's uh, has been a great teacher to me in many different ways. Um, yeah. He used to talk about various ancient methods of playing music, and mm-hmm. that impressed him more than anything, and and I, I was so surprised he could go anywhere in the world on music, any any different level on it. And, but but you were involved with him in a in, in a, a song, right? An album. Well, two C Train albums were produced by George Martin. Yes, yes. And I was on both of those. Right. Wow. Congratulations. He's someone to really work with. He really is. C Train was very popular in D.C. That was our that was our stomping grounds. Need to take our last break here on Twenty First Century Radio uh, with our guest, bluegrass legend Peter Rowan, about his early days in music, and we're winding down now. And this has been a marvelous experience for me. It's probably we probably roughed them up a lot today, but but we didn't mean that. But we'll be right back. We'll go out listening to Peter Rowan's band Sea Train and their biggest hit. 13 Questions, produced by our friend Sir George Martin. Deep in the darkest hour of a very heavy week, three earth men did confront me, and I could hardly speak. They met me in a hurry, they left me tired and sore, and when I'm fit for wishing, I hope they'll come no more. Why, what for? They showed me 19 terrors and each 
Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. We're in our final space here, I'm sorry to say, because I have just learned so much. In the land of Navajo, when I listened to this, um, there was a couple of books that I wrote that dealt with the League of the Iroquois Indians, who were really mm. key to the founding of this country. I've been beaten mm. up so much on this from other people who didn't do their homework, but every mm. time... I listen to you yodel and things of that nature. It just is so thrilling because mm. it's, a, it's a higher level of consciousness right there. And, and these beings, they have taken so much. I'm so glad that we have a new president because he knows about these, uh, the native traditions and things of that nature. And I don't think he would oppose every time that I used to talk to other politicians about the League of the Iroquois and that where we got our founding fathers and et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. So that's thrilling to me. Uh, you, you're very deeply involved in all this kind of music in that area, aren't you? You mean Native American music or what? Well, yes, Native American music and sound. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was a great fan of... Uh, a uh, man who used to sing with Pharaoh Sanders, who was a blues singer, a uh, jazz singer, and he yodeled with Pharaoh Sanders. And I I learned to yodel as a kid listening to cowboy music. And when I heard that, 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 that kind of opened things up for me. Uh, I used to go into the woods and just sing to the trees and hear how my voice sounded in the woods. That was a different kind of feedback to sing in nature, to play music in nature has always been a really uh, nourishing source of inspiration there. And yeah, I like uh, I like really ancient musics. I like, uh, there's some Tibetan music that, uh, that I play that it's not a, based on stringed instruments, but it's more a drum and, you know, a bell and melodies that work with these rhythms of, interplay between time signatures, really. There's a free play of, uh, what you call it? You could simply say like a three-quarter time played in a 4-4 four, four format. It, it frees the mind. I and mean, it's something I was going for, even in the American Eagle tragedy, where half the song is a shuffle and the other half is, is a interpretation of time in a, in a, a different way. The verses are one way of feeling the, the time and the choruses are a straight ahead shuffle which is a you know african of origins six eight or or twelve twelve over four or, you know uh, well, you've got a four four thing going but you've also got a three count on top of it uh, what, what they call triplets or uh, what george martin would call paradiddles, paradiddles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it's an ornamental uh yeah it's not decorative in, in terms of paint, speaking of a paint, painting analogy, it's not a, it's not decorative, but it's ornamental in that it be, might be what you would get uh, from a certain uh, color combination and the underpainting coming through. Mm -hmm. It's sort of uh, an analogy of that sort of, the, of what this, these ancient sounds are. Bone bone instruments, bone flutes. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I even have a little marimba here that I flew around with. Uh, rain sticks, all this stuff from jazz, you know. When I got with the jazz players that in the 60s, they were, you know, they were using all kinds of sounds. 
And in fact, David Grisman and I took up the saxophones and used to do a, an extended intro to the American Eagle tragedy on saxophones. And I'm sure we did it at the <laughs> opening for the doors when you saw us. Yes, we I did. think we, we did the whole saxophone bit. And because we were close to New York City, we might have had our full horn section. That might have been what it was. It was very Ornette Coleman-inspired uh, freeform intro to the American Eagle tragedy. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to change us where we're going right now for a little while because of Jerry Garcia. I want to hear about your working with Jerry Garcia during the height of the Grateful Dead's popularity. You played together in a bluegrass band called Old and in the way, where Jerry Garcia played banjo. What brought you all together? Well, after I had, uh, you know, stayed in Texas for a while, writing Midnight Moonlight, and did my last show with the uh, C train up in D.C., I uh, I went on a, a mountain retreat up in Vermont with a Tibetan Lama called uh, Chogyam Trungpa, and uh, learned some more about, you know, meditation and the uh, the whole lineage of, of uh, spirit, spiritual practitioners down through the centuries, and uh, come that come that fall, I had been studying on the American Indians all all of, during this time too, you know. And I wasn't on the road, so I had some time, and I grew a garden, and uh, you know, I started to have a life. And uh, come the fall, we, uh, my lady and I, took off for uh, whom, whom you met, I believe years ago, we took off uh, for the Southwest and uh, went through Anadarka, Oklahoma, and on out through uh, the Palo Verde Canyon, the, the historical places of American Indian migrations and, you know, reservations, made it up through Taos, and then out onto uh, the Hopi Mesa, where I uh, wrote In the Land of the Navajo. And then ended up back in California, and I was surprised, even at that time, to see how much the traffic had uh, had. If people were starting to move to California, and, and definitely, it was my third time across the country by car. And we uh, came into a little town, Stinson Beach, where uh, I rented a part of a barn that had an apartment above it. It began a three-year uh, residency in Stinson Beach, California, and up the hill lived Jerry Garcia, and Dave Grisman was living there um, in a compound with my brothers, and they were recording an, al an album for Clive Davis at Columbia Records. So Dave Grisman and I, again, we reunited again and started picking the bluegrass, and he said, yeah, Jerry lives up the hill. Let's go see him. And we went up, and uh, there he came out of the house just grinning, and uh, <laughs> he had there was a sign above the gate that they're called... Dan Susi. He came out. We came up to his house. He was standing in the yard playing the banjo. And I, that, that was like, it was the greatest start. You know, it was like yeah. he was so ready to play banjo. It was his first instrument anyway. And I had still had a, a piece of paper in my pocket uh, that I, I had had a, a rural Yarborough from when I was a bluegrass boy five years before. I had a, the, uh, the phone number of Rule Yarbrough, who had played me the tapes of Vassar Clemens, a retired fiddle player from who had been a bluegrass boy, but also had been, you know, in different Western swing bands and this and that. And I still had that phone number in my pocket. And I called him up and said, "Can you give me Vassar's number?" Because he he had played tapes of uh, Vassar's uh, jamming in, on a New Year's party, and, and I thought, "God, that's the best feeling I've ever heard." So I called Vassar, and he was still able to, <laughs> typical Vassar, I said, we're going to Boston to play a show. Do you you want to come and play fiddle with us? I got this bluegrass band. He said, hey, just tell me where to be there. Send me a ticket. I'll be there. And sure enough, Vassar showed up uh, at the airport along with the Grateful Dead and uh, and Olden in the way and uh, John Kahn, you know. And, and this is when Jerry was doing his own band his R&B band and the Grateful Dead and Olden in the way. Uh, so this was the height of Jerry's multi-musical, multi-genre musical efforts. And again, a great inspiration to be flexible, right? Not everybody can do that. But, uh, you know, Jerry, it took a toll. But, you know, he uh, he loved music so much that he, he was able to 
translate his inspiration both in the Grateful Dead and his R&B band, the Jerry Garcia band, or Legion of Mary, and Old and in the Way. And we just played all the time. You know, it was like the great outlet. We'd talk to Jerry. He'd be on the road. He'd call. We'd be up at Mountain Girls at his house, and we'd all talk to Jerry on the phone. Jerry's calling at 5 today because, or, or, you know, before the sound check you know, in New Jersey, and, you know, it'd be like, how are you doing? Yeah, I can't wait. It'll be, see you. Okay, see you Tuesday when you get back. And we'd play every day up at Jerry's house. That's why Old Men in the Way seems to have lasted longer in my mind than the year and a half of our public performances. Because we did at least three or four months of just jamming every night up at his house. Then we became performing band and professionalism and, you know, show business took its toll. And, uh... You know, it was, it, it, I would say, about two and a half years of lots of fun, a year and a half of recording. Oh, it must have been four or five months of just jamming. And, but it went very fast. It may not have been that, maybe only like a couple of months. And it was like, are you guys ready to go on the, to go do shows? And we're like, well, I don't know if we're ready, but we did. And Jerry's great charisma for the people gave us an audience. And so finally, <laughs> finally, we had a bluegrass band and an audience. <laughs> <laughs> I got them both together. Well, we're, we're <laughs> almost out of time right now. And uh, I'm glad we ended up with Jerry here because we have a couple of presents for you uh, that are linked to Jerry. And uh, I've really enjoyed this so much. Peter, it, you've been so kind to give me this much time. And uh, I know that probably... You had far more important things to do. Thank you for allowing us to oh, do Bob this. Is, Bob, it's a great pleasure to speak with you again. We go back a long way now. We really do. About 50 years. Uh, <laughs> That's I've known right. you, you know, uh, It's a great pleasure to talk with you. Well, maybe you, we can talk again another time. I'd appreciate that, Anytime, too. man. Anytime. But please hold on there. We are going to be saying goodbye to everyone on this planet at this particular time. Thank you again for joining us. It's been a, a real exciting time. Uh, so so exciting that I was nervous. I've never been nervous in anywhere else. It's just that my respect for what you accomplished is just a, your, your extraordinary soul. Congratulations, brother. Bob Hieronymus, man. Peter Rohn loves you. <laughs> <laughs> well, ditto. Take that. <laughs> Well, friends, we ran out of time to talk with Peter about some of his wide breadth of talent and playing many, many styles of music. He talked earlier about how you have to master the fundamentals of bluegrass first, and if you get good enough, you can use those fundamentals to play other kinds of music. We are going to close this hour with short samples of Peter Rowan's many styles. First, here is... My Aloha from his Hawaiian album of the same name, recorded with traditional instruments and musicians on the islands of Hawaii. Far from the Appalachian Mountains, sailing on the deep blue sea, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa. And here is Peter Rowan playing bluegrass reggae. This is a live recording of Peter Rowan and Crucial Reggae, recorded at the Magnolia Fest in Live Oak, Florida in 2002.
finally, this is the Free Mexican Air Force, a four-piece band Peter Rowan often plays with performing his more Tex-Mex musical style. Learn more about Peter Rowan at his website, peter-rowan.com. Thanks for joining us on 21st Century Radio, and see you next week. Uncle Sam, it is a misery, put a nix on the fields of Guerrero. Sent you down all gringos and wetbacks who dare wear sombreros. Either run for your life, surrender, or stand up and fight. Or join the free Mexican Air Force.